This morning we're going to be studying from over in Joe in the fourth chapter. If you want to turn over there, we'll be spending pretty much the entire lesson there. In this particular chapter, Jesus has gotten very popular. He's currently down along the Jordan River baptizing. John Baptist is around in the same area. And we're told over in verse 1 that Jesus learned that the Pharisees had found out that he was gaining more disciples and baptizing more disciples than John the Baptist. One thing that we really don't appreciate in our time is how unpopular with the government popular people are. The government, the Roman government in particular, did not like people who were able to gather large crowds of people around them because those are the kind of people that start rebellion, start trouble. So when Jesus found out that the Pharisees had found out that he was gaining more and more disciples, he had decided to leave the area and head over to Galilee. Was from. And we're told over in uh, verse 4 that he had to go through Samaria. Now, this is a small, just a little phrase. And John's going to be doing some interesting things in this chapter. He is going to be introducing things, and he's not really going to be explaining why he's introducing them. He's going to be talking about things and not really explaining what's going on. And that kind of annoys us when we're reading because there's certain little questions we would like to answer. I mean, what was this Samaritan woman's name? Why is the water pot seem to be kind of significant through here? Why is there this animosity between the Samaritans and stuff? That's actually one he will be addressing. But there's lots of little questions, and John isn't going to be answering some of those things. It's up to us to sort of make our own decisions. But we're told that he had to go through Samaria. Now, if you look on a map, it's pretty obvious why he had to go through Samaria. He wanted to go to Galilee, and Samaria is in between Galilee and Judea, where he was. But we know that Jesus was along the Jordan River, and there were roads along the Jordan River. He could just travel one of the roads there and then hop across the Jordan River, and he's in Galilee. He didn't have to go through Samaria. But the Bible says he did. So he makes this journey through Samaria, and we're told that he came to the town of Samaria called Sychar, Near the plot of ground, Jacob had given his son Joseph. Jacob's well was there, and Jesus, tired as he was from the journey, sat down by the well. It was about noon. So we're going through Samaria. Jesus seems to be in a hurry. He, we're told that he had to go through Samaria. Apparently, he's pushed himself so hard on this trip that by the time they get to this little town in Sychar, he just sits down, sits down by the well, and he has to rest. It's about noontime. I'm told that the women that usually drew the water would usually draw water in the, ap in the afternoon or in the morning when it was cooler. But it's noontime right now, and he's sitting by the well, and we're told he's tired. Apparently, he had a place that he wanted to be at a certain time, and now he's in Sychar, and he's sitting down. And a verse 7, a Samaritan woman comes up to the draw water, and Jesus says, Will you give me a drink? Told his disciples to go into town to buy some food. We as Americans aren't really enormously class conscious. We don't have caste, we don't have the social classes that other countries have. So what Jesus is doing here probably doesn't strike us as severely as it would have as people back then. But people in other countries, I work with some people from other countries, and believe me. They know what group you're a part of. They know what caste you're a part of. They know what social structure you fall into. You put a group of them together, they'll figure out who fits in where very, very quickly. And Jews and Samaritans did not associate with each other. They had a feud going back hundreds of years, and they remembered it. And so when Jesus asked this woman, would you give me a drink of water? He knew exactly who she was, and she knew exactly who he was, and they both were very conscious of what they were supposed to do. We do it all the time, getting on an elevator with someone, don't make eye contact with them, pretend they're not there. She was going to draw her water, and Jesus was just going to be looking the other direction. But he didn't. He said, would you give me a drink of water? <clears throat> You may sometime in your life have gone up to a person that was from another place, held out your hand to shake hands with them, and they step back and say, sorry, I can't touch you. 
Or maybe you might be in a store and you want to pay for what you bought and the tender says, just put it on the counter because I don't want to have to touch you. It, it bothers you. You know it's not personal, but it is personal. When someone feels that you are a part of the group that is so bad they can't even touch you. Well, this particular situation going on here was so bad that Jesus couldn't even touch something she had touched. And to drink out of the same thing she was drinking out of, that's a very intimate thing. We're aware that we take the communion with one cup. That's a very intimate act of fellowship and communion. And so when Jesus asked this woman, will you give me a drink out of your bucket, that was unheard of. She was an unclean person, and anything she touched was filthy to a Jew. And the woman even says to this, the woman said to him, you are a Jew and I'm a Samaritan woman. How can you ask me for a drink? For Jews do not associate with Samaritans. Notice she points out, I'm a Samaritan woman. Of all the dirty people in the Samaritans, the women were considered to be the worst. They were considered to be almost the source of the defilement. And so Jesus was saying, will you let me drink out of the same cup you drink out of? She was shocked. She said, this isn't how it works. And then Jesus said, if you knew the gift of God, and who it is that asks you for a drink, you would have asked him, and he would have given you living water. I said it in some of the other lessons we've been going through, John, that John likes to have these conversations that are out of sync. You go over to chapter 3 with Nicodemus, and Nicodemus is out of sync with Jesus on understanding what it means to be born again. You have this Samaritan woman here. She's not going to really understand this idea. He's going to be talking about living water, and she thinks he's talking about water in the well. You have other ones where people just don't understand what it is Jesus is talking about. So he says, if you knew the gift of God, if you knew who was was talking to him, you would be asking me for something. Instead of me asking you for some water out of this well, you would be asking me for living water. And she says, for pointing out the obvious, sir, you have nothing to draw water with, and this well is deep. He's sitting on the edge of the well asking someone for water because he doesn't have anything to draw water with. In our world, our time, we might think of a well as being one of those ones with the bucket there and the crank, and it's always got a bucket there for you to get water with. No, this well was about 100 feet deep, and you brought your own rope and your own bucket. And she says, you don't have anything to draw water with. How are you going to be giving me this living water? Living water to them was water that was flowing. It was coming from a stream or a fountain or something. And she says, you have no way to get any water, living or otherwise. And she points out in verse 12, are you greater than our father Jacob, who gave us as well and drank from it with himself, and as did all his sons and livestock? Who do you think you are? Jacob gave this as well. Are you greater than Jacob? You hear some preachers sometimes say that, or someone say that she spoke better than she knew. This is a point where someone's speaking better than she knows. Someone greater than Jacob was, though. She just didn't realize it. And Jesus goes on, Everyone who drinks this water will be thirsty again. But whoever drinks the water I give them will never thirst. Indeed, the water I will give them will become a spring of water welling up to eternal life. I can give you something no one else can give you. Yeah, you can get water out of this well. Yes, it's a good well. It fed Jacob and his sons and their livestock. We're all able to get water out of here, but I can give you something different. I can give you water that will become a living thing inside you. And notice he said it's going to be a spring. It's not just that it will fill you up and you will never be thirsty again. It's something that's going to overflow in your life and will be springing and going around to other people. He says, I can give you that. If you knew the gift of God, if you knew who it was that was talking to you, you could get this. And she says, so give me this water. 
I don't want to have to keep coming to this well over and over again to draw water. Give me this great water you're talking about. You know, I think she was really enjoying this conversation. Because we're going to be finding out she's a woman with a history. She's a woman with things in her life she didn't like talking about. And it's nice to be traveling and to meet someone that you enjoy talking to, and they don't know anything about you, and you don't know anything about them. All of you don't have all that baggage in your life that you carry with you everywhere you go. But you talk to people you've known all your life, and they know all the silly things and stupid things you did in your life, and you know all about their lives, and we all carry those expectations around with us. That wasn't going on here. He didn't know her, and she didn't know him. Or at least she didn't think he knew her. So she's enjoying this conversation, as strange as it is, and she's talking to him. And now he's going to go the one direction she didn't want to go. Go call your husband. Bring him here. She could have answered in quite a few different ways. Oh, my husband's away. He's not here. Or, oh my, look at the time. I really must be going. But she answers truthfully. I have no husband, she replied. And Jesus said to her, you're right when you say you have no husband. In fact, it is you have had five husbands. And the man you now have is not your husband. What you've said is quite true. Wow. Even according to our modern standards, married five times and living with someone who's not your husband after five marriages, that's a messed up life. She was the kind of person that no decent person is seen talking to. She was the kind of person the kids can be mean to. Parents won't be upset with her. This isn't the life she wanted. You know, when she was a little girl, I'm sure she had ideas and thoughts and dreams about what was going to be going on in her life when she grew up and she got married. Five divorces and just living with someone, that wasn't what she ever dreamed of being. This wasn't the life she wanted. This is the life she's now stuck in. And this is the person that Jesus personally was traveling across Samaria and wanted to meet. The person that nobody else wants to talk to. And he credits her and says, you told me the truth. Jesus likes it when people tell the truth. Verse 19, sir, the woman said, I see that you are a prophet. Our ancestors worshipped in this mountain, but you Jews claim the place that we, we must worship is in Jerusalem. Now, that's quite a turn in the conversation. Topic of her life, her marriages, or things that she doesn't want to talk about. But this is obviously someone worth talking to. Just flux of the conversation over in a different direction. The Jews and Samaritans worshipped in different places. Jews worshipped in Jerusalem. The Samaritans worshipped in Gizarin, that mountain that they could probably see from where they were. But she's fine with that. That's what direction we're going to go in this conversation. We'll go in that direction. Woman, Jesus replied, believe me, a time is coming when you will worship the Father neither on this mountain nor in Jerusalem. You Samaritans worship what you do not know. We worship what we do know, for salvation is from the Jews. It is time is coming and has now come when the true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and in truth, for they are the work kind of worshipers the Father seeks. God is spirit, and worshipers must worship in the spirit and in the truth. <coughs> It's popular nowadays to say, or hear people say, when you're talking about other religions, well, we all worship the same God. Jesus didn't believe that. He said, we Jews understand who we worship. You Samaritans, you don't know what you're worshiping. You have to worship God in spirit and the truth. Spirit, the Holy Spirit, inspiring the scriptures that we're reading from. The Holy Spirit that Jesus told his disciples that he would have the Father send to them, the Comforter, the Helper, who was going to guide them in all truth and teach them. The scriptures that we're reading from right now, Spirit inspired. Can you worship God truthfully and accurately without that? 
Jesus, I am the way and I am the truth. When you worship God correctly, honorably, without Jesus. Jesus said you have to have the spirit, you have to have the truth, you have to have me to be able to worship God correctly. He said, yeah, right now you have to go to Jerusalem to worship. He said, the time is coming when no, that is no longer important. What is important is you have God, you have the Holy Spirit, and you have Jesus in your life, and you will be able to worship him correctly. Those are the worshipers God is seeking. Then the woman says, I know the Messiah called Christ is coming. When he comes, he will explain everything to us. And Jesus declared, I, the one speaking to you, I am he. You go through all the gospel accounts. Look for every time that Jesus told someone openly and plainly, I'm the Messiah. I'm the Christ. As far as I know, it's just this one place. To a woman who had been divorced five times, who was just living with someone right now, who was part of a nation that was considered unclean by the Jews, this is the only person that he has openly said, I am the Messiah. That person that you've been waiting for is standing here right now talking to you. And think about the person talking to you. A Jew, worn out from a journey, dusty, thirsty, and hungry. He was just sitting on the edge of the well waiting for someone to show up and give him a drink of water. God comes into our lives and places and through people that we may never expect, that we may not be looking for. But he comes into our lives those times when we need him and he's there for us. This woman didn't go to the well looking for Jesus. And she didn't recognize him when she saw him still comes in her lives and touches her lives in very unexpected ways. So at this very critical moment, at this really tense moment when Jesus is declared, I am the Messiah, his disciples come back. They've gone into town to buy some food, to get something for him, and they show up right at this moment. And to say that it's awkward is quite an understatement. The disciples return, and we're surprised to find him talking with a woman. But no one asks, what do you want, or why are you talking to her? You show up, and it's silent. Everybody wants to say something. Everybody wants to say, who are you, and what are you doing here? Or, Lord, or teacher, why are you talking to her? But they've been with Jesus long enough to know that it's better sometimes to keep your mouth shut. But she does kind of something unexpected. Verse 28, then leaving her water jar, the woman went back to town and told the people, Why did she leave the water jar? She didn't need it, did she? Jesus had promised her water that was living water. It would well up in her like a fountain. It would be overflowing in her life. Perhaps she left the jar because she didn't need it anymore. And she now had it welling up inside of her and she had to share it with other people. You know, there's times in your life when you learn something that excites you so much that you have to tell other people about it. When something so wonderful happens in your life that you have to share it with somebody else. And she had told Jesus, I want this water. And you give it to her. And right now it's springing up in her life like a fountain. And you can't hold it all in. You have to share it with someone. So she goes into town to those people who knew she'd been divorced five times, who knew she was just shacked up with a man, who knew that she was not the kind of person that anybody wanted to talk to. And now she's going up to them in verse 29, come and see a man who told me everything I ever did. Could this be the Messiah? And they came out of the town and made their way towards him. So she's gone. Disciples were relieved. So they gone and they got food and they brought it back to Jesus and they're trying to get him to eat something. He's tired, he's hungry, he's thirsty, and he won't eat anything. And they're saying to them, Master, Rabbi, eat something. But he says to them, I have food to eat that you know nothing about. Another one of those times in the conversation, Jesus talked about spiritual things, his disciples are thinking about spirit 
physical things or saying to each other, did somebody go get him some food and we don't know about it? And Jesus says, my food is to do the will of him who sent me to finish his work. Don't you have a saying, it is still four months to the harvest? I tell you, open your eyes and look at the fields. And as he's saying this, people are coming out of the town of Sychar across those fields. And Jesus says, look, the harvest is now. The harvest isn't four months from now. The harvest is now. And every, even now, the one who reaps draws a wage and harvests a crop for eternal life. He said, you guys, we're going to be reaping a harvest. You didn't sow the seed. You didn't make it grow. But you're going to be reaping the wages from it. And even now, the one who reaps draws a wage and harvest a crop for eternal life so that the sower and the reaper may be glad together. Thus the one said, thus the saying, one sows and another reaps is true. I sent you to reap what you have not worked for it. Others have done the hard work, and you have reaped the benefits of their labor. Jesus works in very unexpected ways in our lives, through people that we may never expect to reap any benefit from. But he tells us to open our eyes, and look around, and he said, the harvest is four months from now. That's now. And he said, other people have done the work, and we may be the ones doing the reaping, or maybe we're the ones sowing the word, and later on somebody will reap. I'm sure there's people here that have spoken to someone and thought, that was wasted effort. But the word of God stays in people's lives, and sometimes it starts to grow in unexpected times. So we may be the one doing the sowing, and someone else does the reaping. But Jesus went in this little town, spoke to the most unlikely person that anybody would ever tell the gospel to. And she went and she spread it everywhere. And we can be just like her. We can have the word of God springing up in our life, overflowing in our life so much that we have to go and we have to share it. Is this what happens when something happens in our life that is so wonderful and so special? We have to share it with other people. And that's some a theme we see over and over again in the Bible. When Jesus comes into someone's life, they do something. They're baptized. They go away rejoicing. They go tell other people about it. It's something that has to be shared with other people. It's an active thing in their lives. Then in verse 39, many of the Samaritans from that town believed in him because of the woman's testimony. He told me everything I ever did. So when the Samaritans came to him, they urged him to stay with him, and he stayed two days. And because of his words, many more became believers. They said to the woman, we no longer believe just because of what you said. Now we have heard for ourselves. We know that this man really is the Savior of the world. She had messed up her life. She was stuck in a life she didn't like. Saw no way out. And Jesus gave her a way to start her life. We meet a lot of people in our lives that have messed up their lives, and we mess up our own lives. And sometimes we get to the point we think, God doesn't care about me anymore. I'm a sinner. This woman messed up her life. And Jesus personally came to teach her and to guide her back. If he could help her, he can help us. If we've messed up our life, Jesus can help us start it up. So we want to take this opportunity now to extend the invitation. Anyone that's heard the word of God and believe it, and you want to become a child of God and start your life new, that's something that you can do at this point. You've done those things, and you would like to have the prayers, your brothers and sisters on your behalf, you come while we stand and while we sing.